discussion. I'm we are recording, and, and uh, I'm Don Haas, your facilitator for today. Uh, and I think I said it's an informal discussion. Um, and uh, uh, any announcements? I, I will announce that uh, Cornell has broken ground on the Cornell University Borehole Observatory, the, um, a, a step in the process to Cornell's hopeful plan to uh, heat the campus with uh, deep geothermal heat. And they're drilling, drilling a two mile deep hole in order to see if the geology down there is gonna work for doing that. Um, so I think it was June 20th when they, um, when they actually started drilling. The process is underway there, and I'll put a link in the chat for where you can monitor the progress of that. What's new with anybody else? There are a couple of new faces, so maybe we should do some introductions. Jim's got a hand up. Jim? I'm, I'm sorry, Don, I came in late. So it, are we doing announcements? If not, I'm going to back away. We are doing the announcements. So go ahead Thank and you. introduce yourself to start your announcement too. Okay, sure. So Jim Callahan, Mobile Climate Science Labs. And I'm happy to announce that the Northern California Girl Scouts <laughs> will be doing a conference for Northern California Girl Scouts <laughs> on climate change action in October. So that's pretty powerful and very good. Um, a message I would say to those of us who do, or sharing among those of us who do events and things, how it's it's uh, an interesting time to be getting back to people because I'm reaching back to the Girl Scouts who we have been doing events with, as as you nicely retweeted <laughs> or, or thank uh, that that you know we've been doing that for like 12 years, but been out of touch with them because there haven't been events since COVID, and that means actually going back often to 2019 because an event. We might be usually checking in in May 2019, and we haven't been to. So we're often dealing with whole different staff, right? I mean, you know, three years is a lot, long time not to have turnover. So there are people who you have to kind of all reintroduce to each other. Thanks. But very excited on that. And just a, a big thing of, uh, I guess the other one too is know that all of you, because you're in the Clean Network, is will be there. And that means the Clean Network will be taking part in that too. Awesome. And Gina's got a hand up. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say that we just announced a date for our uh, Accelerating Climate Capacity Engagement and Leadership Summit that's convened by CLEAN. That's going to be September 22nd and 23rd of this year. Put it in the chat. We haven't sent out a registration link, but just save the date. Um, registration is coming soon, but that will be a uh, first of its kind event. Um, for climate uh, education and literacy leaders. So just a heads up. Other announcements? Frank and then Mike. Hello. Um, so I have uh, sort of taken on a new job recently. Um, in the sense that uh, my wife and I have just been uh, appointed as uh, North Pacific yearly meeting, this is Quaker stuff, um, representatives to Quaker Earth Care Witness. And um, the one of the things that has come, come out, uh, come up as, as that, part of that, sorry, it's early here, my tongue is <laughs> it's challenged. Anyway, one of the things that has come about as a result of that was uh, being contacted by the person who's in charge of youth activities uh, for our yearly conference, which is coming up not this week, but next week. And uh, she said, well, since you're involved with uh, climate stuff, what kinds of things out there could we engage our youth in? And uh, Jim, I want to have a phone call with you sometime this week um about that but uh that being said um we we talked about a whole bunch of ideas 
And if anybody has something that is, I guess you would call it shovel ready since it's next week that all of this is happening, um, that involves connecting with a group of Quaker youth about what's possible on the youth climate uh, circuit, uh, please get in contact with me. So I can pass that information along to the person who is in fact responsible for all of those things. Where is the meeting going to be held? Because that would maybe help me think of something to send you. Mammoth, Oregon. It's Western Oregon State. Here okay. Right. Okay. Uh, Frank, maybe, I, mean, I don't want to uh, monopolize this and things, but at, at some point, maybe we could check in for the sake of everyone else of some natural questions over the nature of what they're looking for, because if that can if that can include things that Don does and things that Seth does and Ingrid do, we don't we don't want to have people left out who you know can do things can provide things remotely. So I will tell you at this point, given the conversation I had last week, it is wide open. Well, I don't have any announcements, but I can give a quick update if that's okay. Sure. Um, I was just appointed to the, and I don't sure, I'm not quite sure where the word senior applies, but the senior administrative lead for Cornell's research program on menus of change. Oh, cool. So this is um, a national organization, partners, there's many universities around the country. This involves dining halls and all sorts of the food supply on campuses. Um, and I've also uh, agreed to be specifically on a working group on research projects. But Cornell for one serves 22,000 meals a day. You know, imagine how many meals across the campus are served every day on our campuses. So there's a extraordinary opportunity for an audience. Um, that, so I'm pretty jazzed about that. Yeah, that's very cool. Last, Friday, I gave a keynote to uh, between 500 and 600 teachers. These were teachers that focused on agriculture in the classroom, but it turned out about half were just not necessarily focused on agriculture. And they wanted to hear how food could be used to help tell the climate change story. Um, I just got a kind thank you note saying that it was very well received. Um, that's just kind of one example of the things that are happening in this world of food and climate change because there just is a lot of interest. Podcasts, interviews. I did an op ed on the future of the hamburger in the Hill recently. Um, but I want to get back to this larger group also talking about clean because I'm not sure all 600 people in the audience knew about clean. Anyway, I guess the, the, the note there is a lot of positive developments, developments in this space. That's great. Other announcements, Ginger? Not an announcement, but Mike, um, since you're in that space, one of the things that kind of has driven me crazy, and I don't know if it's something that you could actually, you know, like research or look at if you're only focused on on campus stuff, or if you're also looking at curriculum and stuff, but like the impossible burger comes packaged in plastic, <laughs> you know, and it's just like, Rah! or, or the fact that so much of the non-dairy milk is in the refrigerator aisle when it could be all aseptic. Why are we wasting money on refrigeration when we don't need to things like that? It's just, it's no. mind boggling to me that, you know, they introduce a product that's supposed to be better for the planet, but the packaging or presentation of it ends up you know, just on the continuum continuum of more bad choices and resource waste. No, I agree with you, um, but my space goes way beyond the flat or the dining hall on campus. I mean, we're talking, we're trying to educate everybody, help everybody understand climate change through their wine and the beer and all the other things we love. Yeah. And enjoy. But yeah, there's, there's just two more examples you just raised of, well, we can do that, you know, in a better way. <laughs> yeah. Might be a research topic for one of your grad students. <laughs> yeah, and thinking about waste in the food system is huge, <laughs> which I'm sure you're aware. Um, 
other announcements? Things you'd like to talk about in our informal discussion today? Oh, here comes Frank. Hi, Frank. I was just asking if there are any more announcements. We've had a few. Anything from you? Uh, Gina, did you announce the, the summit? I did. Um, that would be yeah. the big one. That is the big one. It's a big, exciting one. Mark your calendars. Please. Wendy, did you see the PBS story on um, whether people including climate more? No. They interviewed somebody from AMS. <laughs> I think it was on PBS. I doubt it was on. We don't usually watch regular news, so it was probably on PBS. And it was just talking about how many more newscasters are including climate um, overtly in their newscasts. So I thought of you. Oh, <laughs> a thanks, and B. I mean, that's not a surprise to me, but it's great that story's being told and oh, amplified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you're I was not aware, last week climate change versus Climate Change Now focused on food and climate. And the whole goal of Climate Change Now is to get more of it in the media. And they claim to have an audience of about 2 billion because they've got connections around the world, all kinds of problems. For, for those who don't know the um, Climate Matters program, um, which we have partnership between NOAA, NASA, Climate Central, George Mason, and um, AMS actively worked to make exactly what you said, Ginger, happen um, for a very long time. Uh, and so, you know, I imagine it buried in that story is the work of either George Mason, Climate Central, and and because that did not that change was um, I was at the AMS when we surveyed the uh, broadcast meteorologists oh so many moons ago. And you know where they were then and where they are now is fundamentally different. I think there is a Climate Matters trained um, broadcast meteorologist in 85% of the media markets in the United States. That is a no small task. Um, you might have multiple, but at least 85% of the media markets have a climate change trained broadcast meteorologist. Um, so, you know, but what that also says is like, they just lost their NSF funding. Um, you know, so our ability to sustain high impact programs across a decade and more is deeply challenged. I think everybody in this Zoom room would know sustained work is actually where one of our ability gets Achilles heels. Other announcements? And what do you want to talk about? Frank? Frank G? <laughs> so many Franks. Now we have to specify since there's more than one of us. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, just a, a quick addendum to the announcement that, uh, or the request that I just made. One of the things that would really be good for these um, Quaker youth, and we're talking a middle school, high school, as well as elementary school, is um, try is any opportunities of getting uh, other youth to actually do a video chat with some of these folks. I don't yet have the times about when next week this would be happening, but. Uh, again, if you have any leads in terms of the groups of other youth who'd like to talk to these youth and say what they're doing, uh, and I'm talking about groups that have been youth groups that have been to COPS or involved with, um, well, something like uh, Kristen's or, um, or, or Jen's projects. So anyway, there we go. And I don't know if uh, 
this is on my note in the chat, but there was um, a request um, to talk about careers in climate and energy education um, at one of these calls, and I thought that might be a good yeah. topic yeah. for today. Um, we don't have to talk exclusively about that, but it might be good for a little while at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, I, mean, I can just sort of throw out uh, the the Kubo project. That's the um, the deep geothermal project that I mentioned earlier at Cornell. Um, certainly uh, brings to light some other kinds of renewable energy workers than um, than I think the ones we often think of. And, and hopefully it portends things to come. Um, and it uh, repurposes uh, people in the energy industry now doing things that we might not want because you know the biggest, most conspicuous piece of what's going on with that is drilling a two mile deep hole, which of course is using the same technologies as many of the same technologies as the oil and gas industry does. The, uh, the drilling rig for this project is electric, which is uh, different than the diesel powered uh, rigs. Um, but a lot of the, um, the folks are doing much of what they would do on an oil or gas uh, drilling site, um, but with uh, a net zero uh, carbon <laughs> emissions from what's going on. Um, so, I think there's interesting opportunities there. So, Don, one of the, one of the important parts about that story is most people. I was just up in the Finger Lakes region recently, and you didn't call. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm well, we were a little busy there, Don. It was called vacation. Uh, mm -hmm. I tend to try and keep work and and uh, life, uh, you know, balanced at, at least. <laughs> Uh, but, um, you know, the visibility of that exciting story, if it works in Ithaca, is just starting to bubble out, which means that it, a, a whole lot more increased visibility and understanding and awareness of that exciting work. But I was talking with another guy about a, an interesting project you know, on the Cape, and he's in the Rotary Club. And, he, and the Rotary Club are behind the scenes supporting those kinds of projects and trying to replicate them all over the, the country, at least, if not the world. So um, there's, but that idea of increasing visibility of these exciting opportunities and reskilling and, and like, if it could happen here, it could happen here. And then, you know, it just shift, shifts the conversation in powerful and important ways. So, um, but I think we tend not to focus on that part of the equation enough, because right. that's like the public education part. Mm -hmm. uh, of our community's work that I think is plays an outsized role that opens up the door for stuff we do do normally to be even more impactful. Yeah, and I, th I think um, we have a sort of a natural tendency to underplay the importance of public relations related to um, stuff like this. Uh, so we are in pretty regular contact with the local NPR station, WSKG uh, in Binghamton, and uh, I think the story is coming out and maybe there's actually already been a very brief one on, uh, on the project. And um, Nancy Coddington there, who is their um, science and uh, science education person and sometimes science reporter is planning to pitch it to the national NPR, which would be wonderful. And, and hopefully that'll happen. Um, and I, I also know, you know, um, from just communicating in in my professional circles that uh, um, Washington University in St. Louis is is just starting the process of thinking about deep geothermal. And I've been in contact with Michael Y. Session there about um, introducing their geologists to our geologists and engineers and, and things like that. And I think uh, I'm I'm hopeful that kind of thing will play out repeatedly. 
Now, and since we live in the same neighborhood, I just had geothermal put in our house and the contractor said they have a backlog of 50 to 60 additional jobs right here in our general area. That's this awesome. is the uh, you know, direct bore going down yeah. 500 feet, not two miles, but. Yeah, correct. <laughs> real positive news. <laughs> Ingrid, go ahead. I was thinking about the topic of careers in climate and energy education. I, I feel like it's those careers are mostly in um, nonprofit organizations, um, some in utility companies. Like I'm trying to think of the people I know. Uh, professional societies or professional organizations, I don't get a sense of like major expansion of careers in climate and energy education within schooling, um, school districts. It, it seems to me that, you know, there, there are science teachers and maybe other teachers who are learning more about it so they can teach it, but I don't see school districts hiring teachers specifically for that. Yeah, and I don't know. It, and it, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was thinking in New York State, too, we just had um, several bills in the legislature on climate change education, and they all failed to, to make it through. I don't think they were even voted on or brought up for vote. Yeah, they, so there doesn't seem to be a sense of climate and energy education as a climate change solution that we need to support and, and hire educators for, at least from that, that side of things. Yeah, I will note that across the border um, in the before times, right at the end of the before times, um, I attended a, a kickoff for a, uh, um, a regional uh, group involving 10 universities and I think pretty much all of the school districts in Southern Ontario where uh, the plan was to um, use the school's physical plant as an opportunity for teaching about um, energy efficiency and, and retrofitting and putting solar in, uh, on um, school property and in places where wind was feasible to do that too um, and engaging the students in those changes. Unfortunately, um, things got waylaid when the pandemic started and I and I'm not sure where the, those projects stand but I'm it's on my to-do list to check back in and, and see what's going on there um, and there are a bunch of hands up now uh, Sean you want to go ahead am I pronouncing that right yeah you win a prize um, I'm Sean McQueen I'm with the Bonneville Environmental Foundation and we are based in Portland Oregon but we work nationally and we work a lot in exactly this space that you just brought up so I know I just popped in late, apologize for that. I'm actually building uh, miniature power lines to give away to teachers. So that's why I'm in my garage, but I'm bringing this up because there's a bunch of efforts going on to actually address literally that, to get teachers prepared to teach these things. There's big, um, from nationwide to regional to statewide initiatives to pull up all the energy careers that touch literally every type of career opportunity from you know, wildlife biology, you could be doing engineering, you could be doing skilled crafts and trades, literally every career you can think of is exists inside of a utility. And so there's a bit of a scramble with a lot of folks trying to make sure we get ahead um, at the scale needed for the big clean energy transition, right? So I'll throw in a bunch of links in the chat. There's several different um, uh, organizations that I've actually have on the note to connect them to you all this network specifically because I'm in multiple um, networks where people are saying they can't find curriculum. And I'm like, what are you talking about? So <laughs> there's curriculum all over the place. And I think what's missing are connections. And so I would love to make connections with folks in this group to not only see what the Clean Energy Education and Workforce Alliance, which is could be a subset of this group, but deep dives into energy specifically in the nerded out every capacity you can imagine and there's well over 100 members of that group. And then there's also IREC, the Interstate Renewable Energy Council, has the National Clean Energy Workforce Alliance. I'll put that in the chat as well. They're also dying for connection to um, curriculum and education. And then there's the state of Oregon, the state of Washington, has um, workforce development things that are being, in Oregon, for example, being led by Portland General Electric 
and the Oregon Talent Investment Workforce, or I, they changed the name. It's like Workforce Investment and Talent Board or something like that. Anyway, there's also like the state of Washington has centers of excellence in clean energy and also around that. So there's a whole bunch of hydrogen hubs and all kinds of things that workforce in tandem with infrastructure is a really big deal. And I don't like the word workforce. I prefer talent because we're talking about human beings here. But these are all about solutions that are probably more focused on the, you know, the stuff, the poles and wires and all the decarbonizing, heavy industry decarbonizing gas, even to renewable gas, like taking gas from the surface of the earth rather than fossil gas. So I would love to differentiate the two. Taking gas out of the waste stream is different than fossil gas, right? So we're talking about all kinds of things like that. So I can say a whole bunch of things and I, I always have this. Uh, yes, uh, Frank, we will. So I would love to talk about this because I see lots of energy, literally, no, no pun intended, lots of energy growing around all this. And I would really like to make these connections. So I'll stop talking and happy to answer further questions, but I'll slowly start populating the chat with these networks that I was literally just mentioning. And that's why I, I happen to notice my email and I'm like, oh, I want to jump in there and reconnect that because it is summertime. Maybe we can get some conversations on. So I'll stop talking. <laughs> Thanks. And, um, and uh, Frank is looking next in my queue, I think. Frank Ann, that is. Uh, hey, Sean, it's so good to have you back. Um, so uh, great timing. Uh, I see what you're describing as a very important part of what we have to do here. Um, and I, but one of the areas where I'm seeing exactly what you're describing is there aren't enough electricians full stop, not even close. If you look at the climate plans and the strategy of electrify everything, heat pumps, you're gonna put that many heat pumps in, you need HVAC technicians and electricians. If you are not generating enough of those two positions, all climate plans will grind to a halt. They will never hit their targets. And that's where we come into the equation. Um, but, you know, so the CTE side of schools, so Ingrid, to your point, um, we may not see classroom teachers like the kinds we're used to talking about, but career and technical education educators, oh boy, are they going to need a whole lot more of them to generate the electricians and HVAC, whether it's community college, CTE, high school, plus community college. It's usually one to two years of extra schooling from K-12 we're talking about, but I see this as a massive limiting factor that must be figured out how to address or all climate plans are gonna be hampered massively. And we know there are other technicians, these, these critical, so what I, I found a recipe that seems to make sense um, is that if you need additional education and you need certification to do a climate solution job, you're gonna need something more. Solar, te I mean, um, solar technician, it's like a week of training on a roof and you're good from what I understand. You don't need a lot of extra schooling to put solar panels on roofs. But if you're going to connect the panels to a grid, you need to be a certified electrician. Unless, John, you can say that that is bunk, but I think it's true. Um, so the limiting factor is the, the extra schooling and certified people. Um, if we don't focus here, and they're going to come from our middle schools. Our kids want to solve. They want to be part of solutions. They want to be learning about the problem. They want to be part of solutions. That starts in middle school. So there's a, there's a strategy here that is still fuzzy. And I think it behooves us to get very specific very soon. And I don't know who's going to fund it. It ain't going to be us federally anytime soon. So we're going to have to figure it out with states. And that's where the exciting work is. Sorry, I'll stop. Uh, Jim. Hey, thanks. Yes, yeah, so, um, so absolutely speaking to, to both of that on it is, uh, I think it's, it's broadening out we in the Klein Network can certainly be part of all, I mean, Frank, you've been, Frank Neopold, you've been stressing, we're part of all forms of education. You know, K-12 may be our base and where we're doing it, but we aren't turning our backs on any, we're doing it. I think I wanted to speak to kind of the fields I know the most about in the cl in climate, climate action, specifically electrical engineers and electricians. How do people get trained as experienced electricians? How do people get trained as really experienced electricians? It is not from people who are paid as teachers, like they're not Kate, they're not a, I am a teacher. They are an electrical engineer, they're an electrician that train the senior ones train the little, the younger ones, the apprentices. And 
now it's also that then there are there are people who are in classroom teachers so maybe after three or four years of experience if you're good in education and you have some background you can then become an educator say in the apprenticeship schools um but most of the training happens that way and i think we're, we're part of it and maybe a thing for people you can go the university degree route and become an electrical engineer and other fields for those who for some maybe because of discrimination against women or uh, people of color or for your family's background that it's hard to get into a good university if you become a union uh, apprentice you can be making fifty thousand dollars a year in your first year you're starting out you are a newbie and you're making fifty thousand dollars a year before uh before um benefits and within three years you might be a teacher okay and you're making one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year these are the fields within it now what i think part of it is we need to from these of us who are climate specialists should be working with those programs to see that they're teaching climate well that they are making the link to climate change because these fields also tend to stick into the old fields that they're they that a huge percentage of what electricians do are exactly what frank was talking about the work is especially in the blue states, I guess, you know, or places where people recognize that we have to do something. Most much of the field is energy efficiency, but it often isn't very well linked to climate science and wealth, you know, to round it out or taking advantage or having the networks work on things. But I just wanted to give a thing that if we broaden out our, our picture of what an educator is, there it, it are people who often their first title is not a teacher. Their first title is I'm an electrician, I'm an engineer who teaches every day on the job. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Eric. Thanks, thanks a lot, Don. Um, yeah, can you all hear me? I'm, I'm, I'm we're on vacation. I, I'll show you the picture of the palm trees here in Hawaii. <laughs> but um, I'm just thinking about having been in this field for a long time as sort of a community science informal educator, sort of the pathway that I've seen in it speaks to what Ingrid was saying a little bit that maybe there's not these, I mean, I think it's two-pronged, right? You've got educators, like you're all saying, that are learning how to do these things themselves, like NGSS has embedded, you know, environmental literacy into it and it, and it builds on itself and there's climate built into the standard. So I think that's great because now educators are becoming more proficient and literate, but then you also need the specialists that can really help push it, put it all together. So. Uh, the examples I'd say, like even, you know, having started in this field 25, 30 years ago, you know, I was trying to do what you said, Don, trying to sort of build the structure, the infrastructure at my old science center so we could use it as a teaching platform to talk about sustainability, have a compost bin, show the solar panels on the roof. I mean, that was, you know, walk the walk, right? So, so you want to integrate it all, but you need the specialists to kind of help propel things. And then it also reminds me, you need the big, the big movers, Frank, like the, the, the administrators that can say, hey, we holistically embrace this as a district or as a community. Here in Hawaii, you know, we were just talking about on, on the beach walk this morning, there's litter everywhere. They don't, they don't even deal with their green waste here in Hawaii. There's no green waste processing in Hawaii like California has. There's no SB 1383, you know, on the books that says we have to procure compost that we make, put it back in our own counties. So they're, you know, and this is a beautiful state and it's a limited, very limited where, you know, they have, I'm assuming there's a big landfill somewhere here that all this stuff is going to. And yet this green waste is a tremendous resource that could be used to, to grow, to, to, you know, put on the, the pineapple plantations and, you know, they're not closing the loop here. So it's like 30 years later, I feel like we're still not holistically doing it, but then you've got groups like Penn Strands sort of at the state level driving this huge initiative that's trying to embed sustainability education K-12. We're, we're developing a curriculum for K-12 that hopefully will seamlessly integrate into, you know, the, the whole fabric of, of education. So, but it's challenging because a lot of districts have adopted science curriculums and they're doing it like what you all were saying, the old school way. They're not thinking like how to, how to move things forward. So it's, but I feel like we are moving in the right direction, but we just need to put all the dots together now and, and really start with holistically move together. And it, it's like there needs to be this, this, this sort of paradigm shift in people's mentality where the, the society needs to, to sort of back everything. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's, we're getting better, but it's still not where we want it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Oh. Mike? Yes, I agree with and support everything that's been said on sort of the technical side, but I recently wrote an op-ed 
for all the graduates of this year, there's 7 million high school and college students graduated. And the title of it is, you've graduated and it's time to find your gift and become a force of nature. You are needed. And the point is, no matter what you do, and I was blown away, uh, you may find your gift in art, poetry, music, humor, a religious group. I found a great article about a bartender who's telling a climate change story every day to a lot of people. Someone in healthcare, insurance, plumbers. Apparently out west, they can install leak detectors and save enormous amounts of water. The point being that they don't, everybody doesn't have to fit sort of the uh, technical side of this, reducing energy use. They can incorporate climate change into matter what they do. And I'd love to share this op-ed with you, but it's, um, you have to buy the paper to get it. Thank you. Ingrid. Still muted. Sorry. Uh, I also agree with the things that have been said, and of course the importance of training for technical careers, but I think maybe um, we're talking about different things. So I was thinking about, um, so Steph, you mentioned in the chat earlier, you came to this meeting, partly because you're gonna be completing your PhD program soon, thinking about a career. Like for someone like that, who's coming out of a PhD program or masters or bachelors and who wants a career in climate change education, um, what are the opportunities for them? And like I said, I think there are some opportunities at nonprofits, like the place where Don and I work, uh, at utility companies, other places, but I, I don't really know broadly where, if someone wants to work in climate change education, uh, you know, what are the places to be looking? And is there growth in, in one of those areas? I figured I'd follow up with my observations since I helped round. <laughs> um, yeah, I that's definitely you know what I was interested in coming to talk about today but I'll just also share sort of what I've observed in recently being on that market is that you know I the of the people in this meeting that I know sort of the career path of I know we have a lot of folks who started in the physical science and found their way into more of the education field um, and I know that in our field we have a lot of discussions about you know obviously border boundary crossing people people who can become generalists and so I feel like my goal was to train as a generalist in the first place instead of, you know, I also have the physical science background, but intentionally adding the social science background. But I feel like a lot of the positions I've seen are still very much people who need to very much specialize in one thing. And it doesn't seem like the position listings seem to value the more well-rounded generalist parts of it. So I guess that's just something I've been thinking about too that I, I think we could all talk about. Obviously having specialists who are really good at certain things is makes sense for many jobs. Um, but I feel like there have to also be specific places where those boundary crossers can come in. And that's what I'm thinking about. That's interesting. I'm, I'm a boundary, boundary crosser and um, uh, you know, my, my job description has, has morphed to be me kind of over time. Um, <laughs> and I, I, it's, it's interesting to ponder um, how jobs like mine come along and, and my gut says that somebody gets a job and then changes it to fit them. <laughs> so I don't know, uh, Jim. Yeah, and if I could squeak this in, maybe I, I recognize this is marginal, so I won't try to push it any more than marginal. But I think there would be the thing of recognize uh, is if our field, if the network can recognize that this is legitimate as an educator, people who, again, their job title is not an educator, but they do volunteer work, they work as an educator at a science museum, at a science festival, they go into schools. And they encourage students, say, to become electricians or electrical engineers or plumbers in all this field. And they help them to do it and they inspire them, especially women, especially people of color. Um, because there is education going on in museums, primarily education, 
that happens on the floor are done by volunteers. They're done by docents. It is not by staff at museums. And so we encourage people who want to do climate education to go into a museum and, and find a way and we'll work with you. I've been doing it for 20 years. There are lots of ways to be an educator on the floor of a museum as long as your museum isn't being bought up by the oil companies and don't want you there, right? You can do a lot of stuff on this. And just to recognize that there's a lot we're doing it and the fields of electricians and engineers, by the way, there's a, there's a, there's a history of, pro bono, of being pro bono. You do things for society. Um, I've always wondered why so many electrical engineers have been a volunteers of our organization. And that's because we tend to do that. Um, doctors, lawyers, teachers don't tend to do pro bono work as, as by comparing to some other fields. So anyway, it's just recognizing that if somebody is in a profession and goes and helps to education, but their title is not a teacher, do we say, no, 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 you can't, you, you're not an educator, we don't recognize you. And I just throw that out. And Franken. Franken. Oh, all right. That's how it's going to go, huh? Uh, there's <laughs> Frank G and Frank N. <laughs> I don't like that. Uh, but I guess it's stuck. Uh, so, uh, Steph, is it Stephanie or Steph? Um, either one. All right. That's cool. So, you, you, you're asking. All right, Steph. Uh, so, you're asking a really in important question, right? Because boundary spanners are critical to this work. So, um, I mean, great, uh, it's a, a critical um, preparation, um, but like where, where do you find an entry point that actually pays you with a salary um, is hard. What I am seeing right now at the national level is that historically what would happen was a lot of grants would come out of NOAA, NASA, and NSF right now. They didn't happen um, this round. Uh, and um, what is happening is states are starting to innovate new, directly focused on climate change learning, climate change education, climate change jobs. Um, and California, uh, I, there are three I know of, maybe four. Washington State, Rhode Island starting to come up with unfunded mandates. There's a lot of stuff bubbling at the state level and down where people who are boundary spanners are going to play a critical role. It's, it sucks that it's not as um, well resourced as it should be, but that's just the nature of where we are at this exact moment. Um, but there's a lot of exciting stuff that's happening. You just got to look um, a little deeper. And I, I you know, Sean, I, I saw your head bobbing up and down, right? Like it's, it's, it's in those networks of organizations and it's at, at like um, philanthropically funded here and state funded there. That's what I'm seeing right now. So finding um, that is gonna be where you're gonna find an entry point, a toehold, as opposed to um, like a, a big NSF grant that's doing you know three, $5 million over three years. It's just not happening. Um, it sucks. Um, and I'm pissed that it didn't happen this round. Uh, but but that doesn't change anything. But what, there are pathways in there, so it's a really important point. And Jim, to your point about about climate change educators, a uh, good colleague of ours, Deb Morrison, has been really promoting this idea of community learning. Like learning happens across many modes of education, and the learning is what's important. Who does it? It's it's a lot of different professionals, whether it's pro bono, professional. It's a, it's a it's much more of an e learning ecosystem approach. I don't know if I like that term, but you know what I mean. That's way more the reality of it than you know just K twelve classrooms. That's important, but not sufficient. Ginger. Yeah, and I, <laughs> the states have it if they let you actually do it. Uh, <laughs> but so I'm in Washington, and I do climate education, but it's not part of my job description. And I would encourage you to just look for, you know, water resource educator, and then include climate in your work or whatever, um, you know, any kind of environmental education job should be including climate at this point. So even if that wasn't in the original job description, you know, I think especially if you're talking to your peers and other people are feeling frustrated because they can't find climate climate educator jobs then find other other environmental or education or science education jobs and turn them into climate education jobs um 
the the other thing that I think is really funny is I also move in a, in the adaptation space and it's hilarious the job descriptions because nobody does that yet it hasn't been done so nobody has the qualifications or experience and it's hilarious that they expect them to come with those experiences because it's brand new so to to these are like unicorns that they're looking for I don't know where they think they're going to find people with half the job descriptions that I've seen so yeah don't be so don't be so worried when you're looking about what the actual announcement says just figure out how you can learn that yeah and apply for jobs that are adjacent to your qualifications <laughs> yeah sean go ahead uh ginger i love what you just said there because uh climate just need just like diversity, equity, and inclusion and justice needs to be threaded throughout every single thing we do, no matter what. I don't care if you run a paint store. So I made like a comment in the um, thing they're talking about companies and environment, social and governance rules. And the SEC is working on codifying something around that, but I'm not an expert on that. But I know there's some stuff on the climate measurements and verifying that. And what's happening, and I, at BEF, we're an entrepreneurial organization that works in the space of environmental commodities also. So I get to hear from 1% for the planet companies and all those companies doing all kinds of things. And they're um, struggling to find that kind of talent. And they're having, I mean, you wouldn't expect it, but an MBA may have some uh, some value in, in what you're looking at. So when you, I, I kind of appreciate, I, though I work right now in the K through 12 space, um, I really appreciate that expansive look at educators, formal and non-formal community, business, um, clergy, and faith-based communities. That all, the like caring for creation, all those folks doing all the stuff all at the same time. I think uh, our CEO Todd Reeve, um, who works a lot in the water space, though, he kind of talks about it's like it's a crisis, not a buffet. We don't get to just pick and choose our favorite thing. We need to do all the things. <laughs> so um, I really want to just emphasize that because when we talk about um, climate education and linking it to DEI and linking it to energy plan. I don't care what someone's doing. I mean, some of the funders of our program are advanced manufacturing companies because they need their um, employees to be energy literate to the point where their company is pointless without, you know, having a savvy around their environmental footprint or else they don't operate. And so this might not be a popular thing to say in a group like this, but I will bring it up because we kind of need all the all the levers being pushed at the same time. So I just wanted to bring that up um, for what it's worth. Anyway, uh, thanks again. Sure, thanks. Uh, Jim? Yes, I want to bring up merely an example. So I'm not saying this is the great thing or anything, just an example of how it opens up when we recognize that professions, people of different professions can can help and that's the way things happen. It happens in other fields. It happens in microbiology. It happens in all kinds of things. We're a little slow to the table in climate and, and energy, but I think we can catch up on it quickly. An example. No, you muted yourself. Yes, excuse me. I hit the space button by mistake. Thank you. Our organization in the Bay Area, and there's similar <laughs> examples other wells elsewhere. We are given more space than we have labs for. We're at an event for, with 400 square feet of, of exhibit space right at the beginning of a major event with 15,000 people. I always have trouble filling that space with our labs. We don't have a problem with those organizations bringing in electrical engineer or BEF or someone who's in the area who wants to teach for a day on their project. It doesn't, you know, as long as we look at it, we say this isn't garbage. This isn't like contrary to science or it's criticizing NOAA or you know something that like no you can't do that you know um, that you're welcome we can give you space and they'll let you do that and then from there you're going to have teachers asking you to come to their classroom you're going to have other events you're going to have the Girl Scouts it happens all the time if we open up and we we're we're now a network that are bringing people together so I just want to encourage. Not, again, it's not to step on any, it's all the things you said, Sean, we want to, we, we don't want to be shutting down any of these avenues. Thank you. Frank, G. Yeah, I'm going to go back to this question of, um, of folks entering in on careers and looking, gee, I'd like to be 
I would like to do climate or environmental education, but it's difficult to find the jobs. And the, um, I, I think I was hearing here something like, don't try looking directly for those. Look for something that is like those. And I think about my own career. Um, I started out being interested in environmental education. That was coming out of grad school. That was what I was interested in. And, in, and I ended up doing most of my career as a geology educator. And that was actually an asset. And it's an asset in terms of credibility and access. The access portion is teaching community, community college. You've got access to a real diversity of folks, including folks who would blow you off if you were an environmental educator. And that also goes to the credibility aspect. So I, I think that's definitely something to look at. That must be uh, Eric's view out his window. Oh, yeah. It's a little different from mine. <laughs> awesome. Um, Mike. Yes, a couple of thoughts for Steph who's looking for a job and how um, I'd suggest being as bold as to put climate change into whatever application you submit. Because, you no, know, I don't can't cite the literature, but one experience of a recent graduate that I worked with closely at Cornell, she started with one of the largest food companies in the world. They had nothing in climate change. After three years, she's head of climate change and sustainability for this major food company. Yeah. I'll move on to something else and then the law school, because she really wants to be able to affect policy. Um, those of us who write letters of recommendation, why not just drop a little, oh, by the way, mm -hmm. this individual has uh, taken classes, expertise, experience in this space. And a lot of times it just takes that little nudge to draw attention to this major topic and what it means to that particular employment situation or company. Just a thought. Mm -hmm. Let us know how it goes, Seth. Yep. <laughs> Other thoughts, comments? <laughs> yes. Obviously, a lot of people on here are happy to talk about this stuff. <laughs> I'm impressed that Eric loves us so much that he stopped in while he's on yeah. vacation. Like, dude, go to the beach. <laughs> also, what time is it there? <laughs> thanks, thanks, Ginger. Yeah, no, we're, this is our last. So, oh, sorry. Let me switch this back around. Um, yeah, we're having a good time. It's a family vacation. Uh, they, we're going to a wedding on the, the Big Island tomorrow. Uh, leave for the Big Island tomorrow. This is Oahu. So Fun. yeah, but I miss you guys. I always love the conversation. So, and I, I just saw Gin, uh, Gina's email. I'm like, oh, it's today because we're three hours later than West Coast time, right? So we're like right. six hours different from East Coast. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> nice. I I I had the worst night. We're we have legal safe and sane fireworks, but we're surrounded by Indian reservations, and it's like a war zone here. And I'm just like, I'm so disoriented because my dogs were freaking out until two in the morning. <laughs> just like, yeah, do I have to really work today? I'll just go check into the clean call. <laughs> um, Jim, you want our penalty? Sure. If I could throw in something too, is some of the things that we're at least including in this brings us more in line to being inclusive of other cultures. The indigenous cultures, uh, Mexican cultures, African American cultures, many cultures historically do not take the approach of your educators or people who are separate who you pay to do that job. It is, it is the elders, it is your peers, it's the older children. People learn by teaching each other and, and sharing and, and so on. Um, and it's more the British and the colonial American style that made educators all professionals. They are separate entities. 
And I just want, want to recognize that because I think most of us do have a, a value of indigenous knowledge. And I think there is wisdom in that knowledge and value, at least as one of our techniques, as one of our techniques, not to put down the, the main way. Thanks. Well, it is very close to the top of the hour. Um, any other uh, closing thoughts, ideas? For those of you who don't know, um, the Monolo Observatory, right? The probably the most important data set the humanity's ever generated um, uh, is generated on the Big Island uh, at the Monolo Observatory, right? And it's on the Saddle Road. So Eric, if anybody gets to the Hawaii and gets on the Big Island, going up there, and I just put a link to how to go to the observatory, um, but it's a thing. And there's a book you can sign in and people every now and then will poke you and be like, wait, I saw you in the book. I'm like, what is that? So it's like a pilgrimage for climate people. So I've never said that in the clean call, but <laughs> if you haven't been to the Monolo Observatory, it's a thing. Um, and uh, you might want to check it out. So Eric, you're close. Um, whether you can work it in with the family and the wedding is another matter, but you know, uh, if you need a help, I don't think you need any, but I'm happy to help uh, get you there. It's a cool place. It's worth it. Thanks a lot. We might actually try and do that. Yeah, because I haven't been there before. So, yeah. You're close. Cool. Uh, uh, Jim, you have a final, final thought for us? No, no, no sorry, sorry. I've talked too much. I didn't take my hand down. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Well, it is 1.58, so uh, I've got a 2 o'clock, so I think... Uh, I will say, see you later. Thanks all for the good conversation today. Bye, Thanks, Don. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Don.